How many minutes? 15 minutes? Uh, uh, warm welcome to, to, to the All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh Seminar. Bangabandhu, relevance to the young Bengali diaspora in Europe. I am Dr. Mojibur Doktori, President, International Forum for Secular Bangladesh, Finland. Uh, Bangladesh is celebrating the birth centenary of the greatest son of Israel in thousands of years, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman. This year is the Mujib year. Bangabandhu is not only the founding father of Bangladesh, but also a dreamer of emancipation of Bengali people, hero of independent Bangladesh. Uh, he is an architect of the secular democratic constitution and values of Bangladesh. He is a world leader of the height of Mahatma Gandhi with dedication for, to democracy. Uh, he is a beacon of hope for suppressed people of Asia and Africa. But in this age of digital social media, we see the rise of disinformation, hate speech, fundamentalist or illiberal politics worldwide. Bangladesh is no exception to this. Uh, those challenges the idea of Bangladesh, a secular, inclusive, and equal society for all. It underlines the importance of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman's relevance to the present world today, not only for Bangladesh, but for the whole world, particularly to the young Bengali diaspora in Europe. Uh, and uh, those who are born, Bengalis who are born in Europe and elsewhere in foreign countries, uh, many are not uh, aware of their proud heritage of secular, democratic, democratic and inclusive society and values what Bangabandhu represents to Bangladesh and the world. That's why all European Forum for Secular Bangladesh has arranged today's seminar titled Bangabandhu, Relevance to the Young Bengali Diaspora in Europe. In this seminar, we have five distinguished guests among, guests among us. They are Her Excellency Saida Muna Tasnim, Bangladesh High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Liberia, uh, joining us from London. Welcome, Her Excellency Saida Muna Tasnim. Also welcome, yeah, also welcome Barrister Nadia Choudhury, Law Secretary, Forum for Secular Bangladesh and Trial of 1971 War Criminals. Warm Thank you so much program. for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. Julie Begum, Chair, Sadhinata Trust, a heritage organization based in London. Welcome. Good evening from London. Good evening. Uh, Torun Kanti Chaudhuri, President, All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh. He is joining us uh, from Sweden. Welcome, Torun Kanti Chaudhuri. Thank you very much. Welcome. And Mr. Ansar Ahmedullah, Secretary General, All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh. Uh, he's a cultural and community activist. He's joining us from London. Welcome, Mr. Ansar Ahmedullah. Thank you, Maya. Uh, in this program, uh, in this program, Her Excellency Saida Muna Tasneem is the chief guest uh, of this program, and um, Mr. Torun Kanti Chaudhuri, President of All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh, uh, will preside over today's uh, today's seminar. Now, uh, if if some of you could just uh, uh, mute your mic, it would, it would help to reduce the noise. Uh, yeah. Now I am requesting Ansar Ahmedullah, General Secretary of All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh a cultural and community activist in, based in London, to provide his opening remarks for this seminar. Um, hi, and uh, welcome to this truly international online event to mark the 100th birth centenary of Bangladesh's founder, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, lovingly called Bongo Bundu by his people. The event is being organized by the All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh, known as the Nirmal Committee in Bengali, um, and it's being streamed live on British Bangla News and, and on Facebook. Um, 
we are we are really pleased to welcome our guests today. Um, and first up, we we have Her Excellency the uh, High Commissioner for Bangladesh in the UK, Saida Munatasnim, who will give her a keynote presentation. Followed by all the way from Bangladesh, Nadia Choudhury, who is our Law Secretary of the Newman Committee, um, and I think she will talk about how the young are. Uh, celebrating the, the 100th birth centenary in this um, corona pandemic restriction. Uh, finally, we have Julie Begum, Chairperson of London-based charity, the Shadiyata Trust, set up to promote Bengali heritage and history in the UK, who will respond to both speakers, uh, and I'm sure she'll, uh, you know, she'll speak her mind. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Torun Bai from uh, Sweden and Moju Bai from Finland. And following the presentations, we will have uh, time for discussion, and hopefully people will be able to put their questions to our panel speakers uh, on the chat room, or they might be able to somehow, I don't know, technically fully appear in the screen. Um, and in the end, like uh, Mojibai said, that uh, Tarun Kanti Choji will summarize the discussion and bring the event to an end. Um, so as we've got quite a lot to get through within an hour, Without much further ado, I'm now going to hand over to our moderator uh, for the event, Dr. Mujibu Daftari, who is also our um, Newman Committee's president in Finland, to conduct the meeting. So, Mujibu. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ansar Ahmedullah, for your introduction. Uh, I would like to say that those uh, who want to comment on, on these issues, they can uh, they can they can write their uh, write their comments in the comment section in Facebook Live or YouTube Live, so then we can we can see this and our uh, honourable guest uh, will answer your questions. So before I request our chief guest Saida Munatasnim to give her keynote presentation on the subject matter, I will provide a short profile of the about about chief guest to our audience. Uh, Saida Muna Tasnim is a career diplomat. Uh, she is the Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, Ireland, and Liberia. She served as the head of United Nations Wing at Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, she was the Director General of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh and Ambassador to Thailand and Cambodia. Now I am requesting our chief guest to give her keynote speech uh, to this seminar. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just organizing myself. Um, yes. A very good evening to everyone and assalamu alaikum to everyone who's uh, watching this program. Um, I want to start by thanking the um, International Forum for Secular Bangladesh, Finland, and its president, Dr. Mujibur Daftori, as well as the um, the Secular Bangladesh UK, uh, Mr. Ansar Ahmadullah, for inviting me here. Uh, it's great to be in this program with other very, um, uh, very, uh, you know, eminent, uh, well, eminent personalities such as Nadia Chaudhry from Bangladesh, as well as Miss Julie Begum, uh, Shalinata Trust London, and of course with all the European Forum and everyone who's watching it. Uh, I want to especially thank you for organizing this um, uh, dialogue with young people who live. Uh, who are of Bengali origin, and they live in U UK and Europe, uh, particularly to reflect on how relevant the father of the nation of Bangladesh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and his values are to the young people today, and the legacy that he's left, how relevant is that legacy to learn from, by example, from Bangabundu. So, um, on the occasion of the centenary of the Bangabandhu, I just want to say how honored I am to be speaking here. And on that occasion, I would like to begin by paying my deep homage to our father of the nation, uh, the greatest Bengali of all time, the liberator of Bangladesh and the Bengali nation in 1971, and the, uh, you know, the undisputed leader of our war of independence and undisputed leader of all uh, you know, Bengali nations, political, cultural, economic, social, cultural rights movement and the civil rights movement. So um, with uh, paying a deep homage to our father of the nation, I want to start by uh, conveying to the young people who are listening that to understand Bangabundu, perhaps 
uh, you know, how relevant it is, we need to reflect on a few historical facts. To start with, can we look at how Bangabundu looked at himself? What was his philosophy of for life, for human beings, for you know, for, for people and for politics? And you know, if we want to understand his legacy, uh, you know, what was the values behind the man? Uh, what was his early childhood? His how was he, um, you know, uh, leading as a young adult? Um, his sort of meteoric political rise during the 40s while he was stu a student in subcontinental um, politics, um, his values, uh, his bravery and courage. And of course, you know, the fundamentals of the state that he created, as well as his foreign policy, his humanism, and his culture of nonviolence. Um, I think some of these legacies, to start with, like I said, if I can quote from Bongamundu's Unfinished Memoirs, if anybody reads that book, and I recommend everyone to read this book, all the young people, to understand Bangabandhu and how relevant he is today, uh, we should be listening to this quote. And he writes there that as a man, and this is May 1973, he's already the prime minister of Bangladesh. He's gone through 22 years of you know struggle from 1947 to 71, and then he's finally achieved an independent country. And then he writes his philosophy. But as a man, what concerns mankind concerns me. As a Bengali, I am deeply involved in all that concerns Bengalis. This abiding involvement is born of and nourished by love, enduring love, which gives meaning to my politics and my very being. I think this particular quote defines what Bangabandhu was. Nowhere here he mentions about being a Muslim. He doesn't mention being a Hindu. He doesn't mention being a Buddhist. He mentions as a Bengali. He mentions mankind. And he, men and he mentions enduring love, that his very being and his politics is nourished by, is, is born of and nourished by enduring love, that is love for people, love for humanity. And that gives meaning to his politics and his very existence. So to understand Bangabundu, I would like to ask our young friends, how many leaders in the world have done this self-assessment and given such self-reflection of what does he believe in as a human being. Um, he believes in mankind, he believe, believes in Bengali nation, and everything is, he's doing is done out of love. Um, this kind of charisma, you know, uh, self-reflection, personality, courage, life philosophy, achievements, I think in, in, in every way, Bangabundu, you know, outshines many leaders. I would again go back to a few, uh, you know, um, historical facts. As you know, that in 2004, uh, Bangabundu BBC had run a survey. Now we always address our the greatest Bengali of thousand years, but of course BBC says he's the greatest Bengali of all time. That means in 2004. BBC run a survey. It's a listener's poll, an opinion poll in which, and so we did not create this quote-unquote uh, you know, title for Bangabundu that he's the greatest Bengali of all time, but the BBC did. Because in the poll, uh, the Bengalis all around the world, they took a sample, uh, um, listeners uh, sample from all over the world, and they nominated uh, 140 names who are all Bengalis. And Bangabundu was voted the greatest. He was voted the number one with highest votes with uh, uh, Rabindra Tagore, the Kabi Guru and you know, Nobel laureate, he was in the second position. But uh, many do not know that Bangabundu got double the vote of Kabi Guru, Rabindra Tagore. And why is that? Why is that that you know, he was rated the greatest Bengali of all time and got the highest vote? And this is because in 1972, he created a state which used to be an Islamic Republic. From there, he creates the state he aspires this trade, he envisions this trade, and finally he, he creates this state. And then he, he, on 4th of November, this is the month of November on the centenary year, uh, on 4th of November, he signs up to a constitution which he had drafted with great passion and great vision of what he believes in, where he creates this independent People's Republic of Bangladesh and not an Islamic Republic of Bangladesh. And he puts that the fundamental values of state policy will be Bengali nationalism, democracy, secularism, and social justice. Of course, it was socialism earlier, but now it's social justice. That means equality. Now, if you look at the subcontinental politics, 
And if you look at the constitution of each state around us, you will not find it in most of the states. So in 1972, who drafts this constitution, he signs it on 4 November, and this says what Bongo Bongo should be to the, you know, how, Bongo, how the young people today has to learn from what Bongo Bongo believed in. Uh, in today's world, where the moderator was just mentioning that, you know, where the, we have a world which is rife with intolerance, prejudice, um, you know, violence, um, you know, lack of respect for each other, and so much, uh, you know, xenophobia uh, it, we see in a world which is uh, in a post-COVID world, what's happening in Europe in particular, and other parts of the world, there's so much intolerance and xenophobia, racism, everything is in the rise. And today, more than ever, these values, these fundamental state policies that he put in, in our constitution, the fact that he was asked by everyone to create an, another Islamic Republic of Bangladesh, but of course not. That was not what Sheikh Mujib had thought or Bongo Bundu had envisioned back when he was growing up, back when he was in Kolkata, and I will reflect on that. So therefore, uh, we would like the, new, the young people in Europe to reflect that this vision of a secular democracy, you know, uh, republic, rather than an Islamic republic, where Saudi king had also requested him that, why don't you create, rename it as Islamic Republic? And he asked him that, Bongo Buntu asked Saudi king that, would you name your country first? Because it's the kingdom. Can you please create a Islamic Republic out of that? Uh, for me, uh, we cannot create because I believe in a people's republic. So there was pressure. And of course, still today, many don't believe in it. But Bongo Buntu believed in it. And that's what the young people of today have to believe. Because Bongo Buntu realized when he adopted the constitution that he was creating a state. He was His struggle was based on a Bengali nationalism or instead of Islamic nationalism or religious nationalism, rather a cultural nationalism based on a Bengali identity. And, and this particular aspect is extremely important to understand that, you know, starting from 1952, when he was the, as the chief coordinator of the all, uh, you know, uh, party uh, students, Purishad, you know, the revolutionary, poly, uh, the, it's called the Shangram Purishad, he's the chief coordinator. And as that, Again, he was doing this uh, nonviolent strike, sitting in the in 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 in, in, pris in, in the prison. Uh, it was based again a civil rights movement that he was leading, based on Bengali language and Bengali nationalism. Again, the symbol of Bengali nationalism. So therefore, you know, uh, the fact that you know he and and his secularism always meant that equal respect for everyone, equal respect for every human being, regardless of their religion, race, ethnicity, anything. So this particular politics is reflected, his philosophy and ideology is reflected in our constitution. And um, uh, quite often, you know, uh, some critiques want to say that secularism, by that means absence of religion, not at all. It means that respect for all religions. Um, coming back, you know, this, this religious pluralism that he believed in. Um, if we look at, uh, you know, how many, how many leaders are there in the world? Look at the seven March speech. So that speech, again, was like a charter of rights and demands for Bengali nation. And this speech is, you know, in, in a book, uh, if you look at Jacob F. Hill's book, um, uh, We Shall um, uh, Fight on the Beaches. Uh, and that has the speeches that inspired history. That means the change, the course of history uh, uh, in a country or created a new country that recognizes this as one of the uh, top speeches uh, that, course, that changed the history of um, uh, of course, the history. Uh, and that uh, 7 March speech was later on recognized by uh, UNESCO. And why? Because UNESCO also says, and it was given, you know, this was given the uh, uh, UNESCO's memory of the World Register as a documentary heritage of mankind. That means it's a heritage that when, if there's a nuclear explosion and, uh, you know, this particular uh, information is encapsulated by UNESCO somewhere. Uh, you know, in the world where even, you know, the generations, succeeding generations uh, can learn about uh, the speech that changed the course of history. And that says, you know, to the young people that in that speech, again, Bongo Buntu speech did not say that the speech is for any particular sectarian, uh, any sect or any religion. He was, if you look at the 1966 uh, six point demand, that again, uh, there were the economic, political, and security rights for East Pakistan, for Bangladesh. And it didn't say that, you know, please give me the rights for the Muslims only. 
So he never, he was always uh, focusing on the inclusive and religious pluralism and inclusive philosophy. Um, one more thing, you know, in, in when he arrived in, in uh, London on 8 January 1972, in the press conference, he said that uh, at the Claridge's Hotel, that today I'm free to share the unbounded joy of freedom with my fellow countrymen. We have won this freedom in an epic liberation struggle. The ultimate achievement of this struggle is the creation of the independent, sovereign People's Republic of Bangladesh. Now, this is extremely important, from which my people have declared me as president. While I was a prisoner in a condemned cell awaiting the execution of a sentence by hanging. Um, this reflects that, you know, Bangabundu, while he was, and you know that in Pakistan jail also, he knew that his grave was being created. You know, he was to be hanged. There was a hang sentence. Uh, against him, get sentence. However, he told them that even if I die, uh, and all these values and quotes that you know he's a Bengali, his language is Bengali, his country is Bangladesh, and he should be buried there. This talks about the bravery, the courage, and the fact that even at Fashir Moncho, even at the gallows, he said that you know he's a Bengali. So he's never saying that I am a Muslim. But he is a Muslim. He's a very pious and religious Muslim. He comes of a very, uh, you know, very eminent Muslim family from Gopal Ganj. Um, one more thing I would like to quote is the news, Newsweek in, uh, magazine's 5th April 1971, where they talk about Bangabundhu. And the young generation in Europe, the young Bengali, should be proud to know this, that, you know, they call him the poet of politics. But I want to particularly say the description of Bangabundhu. And they said that tall for a Bengali, uh, with a touch of graying hair, a bushy mustache, and ultra black eyes, Mujib can attract a crowd of a million people to his rallies and hold them spellbound with great rolling waves of emotional rhetoric. Now, this was emotional rhetoric from Newsweek's perspective, but to Bengalis, this was exactly what they wanted to hear. Bongo Buntu told the Bengalis to stand up for their rights, even though it doesn't say that, and it says that he is a poet of politics. So his style may be just what was needed to unite the classes and ideologies of the region. So Newsweek magazine's particular, that particular comment on Bangabundu says that he's not only a poet of politics, but he's actually his style. How did he unite the classes and the ideologies of the region, regardless of their religion, regardless of their you know, sex or ethnicity or gender? Um, later, it was supplemented by Time magazine. I would like to mention a quote by Time magazine, how they described Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib. A man of vitality and vehemence, Mujib became the political Gandhi of the Bengalis. Now, look at the political Gandhi, quote unquote. Uh, it means that, you know, the undisputed leader, the non-violent leader, symbolizing, so they're comparing him with political Gandhi and symbolizing the hopes and voicing their grievances. Not even Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, drew the million strong throngs that Mujib had attracted in Dhaka. Nor for that matter has any subsequent subcontinental politician since Gandhi's day spent so much time behind bars for his political beliefs. So another thing that Bongo Bundu, the fact that he was a man of peace and nonviolence. Yes. So sorry, uh, I have to just continue this disruption. So um, um, uh, the fact that you know he was again. Uh, in today's world, what we need to reflect on and the young people, that he was a man. And here they sit, they compare him to Gandhi. But, you know, if we reflect it, he was a man of nonviolence and peace. Mm -hmm. So his politics was about nonviolence, uh, going to the prison, hunger strike, everything that, you know, Mahatma Gandhi did, Nelson Mandela did. Uh, he never resorted to violence. He never took up arms. He was always a man of peace. And uh, this is something that is particular. And why could he become a man of peace? Because from his childhood, now we have to reflect on his childhood a little bit. And this is extremely important. Um, the fact that, you know, Bongo Bundu was born in a village in Gopal Ganj, and then the kind of childhood he had, extremely exclusive in Gopal Ganj, where he saw his father working in the British institution. And then he, uh, he was encouraged uh, by local school to, to be sent to a missionary school. Now, when he was in his prime youth, in his teen, uh, he's learning every single value from a missionary, from, from somebody who's of a different religion. So he was going to a Christian missionary school and he had this, he's already experienced this inclusive atmosphere where there's a secular atmosphere, everybody's being treated the same, but Muslim students are being same, uh, 
Hindu students are being treated the same, uh, Christian students. So there he receives this guidance from uh, the father of the missionary school who told his father, Bangabundu's father, that please send you, he's, a, he's like a fireball, send him to Kolkata for further education. And his father sends him to Kolkata. And he goes to Kolkata University Islamia College, where by 1943, he's already, he's actually, uh, by the age he was 20, he was already um, uh, about 21, 20, he was undergrad education. He already became counselor of the entire All India Muslim League. He became elected counselor in 46. He was elected as the uh, general secretary of the colleges in Islamia College uh, Students Union. But at the same time, I think the fact that, you know, he went to us in doing that subcontinent, the, the, the heydays of British, the end of the British India and the decolonization period, Bangabundu was in Kolkata. He was actually moving around with Hussein Suhid Sarwadi, who's again a believer of a Bengal state, secular state. And, but then, you know, uh, I'm talking about Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who uh, at that point, who saw the uh, 1946 riots in, in, in Kolkata. And he writes in his uh, autobiography that, you know, how he has seen how Hindu and Muslims, the riots and there's so much violence and little children. And he run two hospices there where he used to give support and food to these people. But at that time, the most significant thing happened that Mahatma Gandhi came to Kolkata and for this is called his peace mission, uh, post riot peace mission. And in the peace mission, Bangabundu joined that peace mission. And he and his friend took photographs all over Kolkata of the communal violence and the you know very graphic pictures. And he actually made a, 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 a album out of it. And if you read his biography, he said that they presented that to Mahatma Gandhi to make him understand what was the extent of uh, violence and sectarianism that was going on in that, you know, just before India got its independence. And that is not the kind of country, that is not the kind of nation that Bangabundu believed in. So that was the message they were trying to give to Gandhi, that Gandhiji needs to see that uh, while he was practicing nonviolence and peace, this is what was happening in Kolkata, just because, you know, the British had divided us along the religion line. That means they created us, you know, they, they created Congress, they, you know, Muslim League was created. And of course, uh, the divisions were based on religion and East Pakistan was put with thrown rather to with, with uh, West Pakistan. So this gives Bangabundu that, that realization, that ideology, that philosophy, that we cannot have a country. First of all, in 1947, when he came back to Bangladesh, within a year, he realized, he realized that, you know, of course, Bangabundu was, along with Hussein Soed Sarabi, he was one of those Bengali Muslim leaders, young leaders who went to the peace mission and who envisioned during that uh, you know, that political dialogue that was going on to uh, for the subcontinent to create three state. And there was a third state that was supposed to be uh, uh, created, which was Bengal and India and Pakistan. And Bangabundu is a believer of an independent Bengal. Later on, you know, when he came back, he realized that very soon, as soon as, you know, 1948 at the Dhaka University Senate, Bengalis were told by Mr. Jinnah that, you know, Bengali, would, Urdu will be the state language. Then in there, Bangabundu knew that we cannot have from 48 to 1971, everything that he did, he knew that we cannot have a state where there'll be divisions, where there'll be discriminations, where there'll be sectarian divisions, where there'll be communalism. It has to be a republic. It has to be, you know, anything we should not, if you look at the six points, it is about actually the self-determination of East Pakistan. And it says that, you know, economic uh, uh, rights, cultural rights, um, defense and security rights, everything that he did, he believed that he didn't believe, learning from the riots, that any state which should be divided along the lines of religion or any state that would be created in the name of religion cannot sustain. We cannot have sustainable peace and prosperity. The golden Bengal that he envisioned, it essentially was based on a country, on a republic, where people will be all sorts of power and there will be no repressions, oppressions, um, you know, in terms of economic, social, cultural rights, civil rights, at the same time, secularism and Bengali nationalism, you know, based on cultural identity rather than religious. Um, I would uh, also um, reflect on some of the comments that our young people need to uh, uh, perhaps can reflect on. Uh, I want to quote Cyril Dunn. So as we all know that, uh, you know, from 72, uh, uh, this particular quote is related to what kind of a Bengali was he to understand? So Cyril Dunn and this eminent British journalist wrote this 
after Sheikh uh, Bangabundu was assassinated in 1974. And it says, I quote, in the thousand year history of Bengal, Sheikh Mujib is her only leader who has in terms of blood, race, language, culture, birth, uh, been a full-blooded Bengali. Now, listen to this, full-blooded Bengali. We need to question ourselves, are we full-blooded Bengali? His physical structure was immense. His voice was redolent of thunder. His charisma worked magic on people. The courage and charm that flowed from him made him a unique Superman in these times. Now, this is Cyril Dunn, eminent British journalist, speaking about Sheikh Mujib in the 70s. Uh, we need to ask ourselves, is there any other leader that people have spoken like this, his charisma, any other leader? in terms of the kind of fire that Bangabundu had, the kind of charisma that he had, the kind of bravery that he had. Coming back to, of course, I want to reflect, I reflected a little bit in, in the history of Bangabundu's growing up, you know, uh, within a secular atmosphere and looking the pros and, and you know, uh, judging and assessing the pros and cons of uh, what could have happened to Bangladesh if we had created it as an Islamic Republic. So that is where we need to salute him on his uh, centenary. And that is where we need to take the inspiration from. Um, one more thing I would like to reflect on is his foreign policy. And as you know that uh, uh, I, I mentioned the Constitution of Independent Bangladesh. And again, uh, you know, uh, from 72 to until he was assassinated in 1975, less than three and a half years, Bangabundu is, you know, right away, he started campaigning for recognition of Bangladesh. There are many states like Kosovo, Bosnia, many independent states, East Timor, that were created in this century. Uh, it took them years and decades to get recognition. Bangabundu got recognition for Bangladesh, universal recognition within three years, that is in 1974, when he went to United Nations. But he was, his foreign policy was friendship to all Malays towards none. And as you're aware that he received the Julia Curie um, Peace uh, uh, um, Prize. And this prize was given because of his nonviolence and peace, which he obviously he was must have been rather than being a political Gandhi for the Bengali nation. He was actually a Gandhian at heart. So, you know, he believed in nonviolent politics, protests to hunger strike, and he received this award. But going back to his foreign policy, we see the same reflection of his commitment to peace, commitment to nonviolence when he says that he wants to resolve everything by peaceful settlement and peaceful coexistence with his neighbors and everyone and says that friendship to all and malice towards none. So from 47, uh, from 72 to uh, 74, by that time, we have uh, already received universal recognition, except for three, four countries in the world. Uh, and I don't want to name them. We received everybody's recognition in the United Nations. He already became, uh, took Bangladesh to international forums, such as the Commonwealth in the UK, and uh, in an online movement, and even the OIC at the Lahore summit, just before where he met Pakistan a prime minister and he was taken there by his friends from the Middle East. And there, you know, he went to the online movement and Fidel Castro said that I haven't seen the Himalayas, but I've seen Bongo Bondhu, Sheikh Mujib, and that is enough for me to understand. So these are the kind of friends and the comrades that he picked up when he went to an online movement in 1973. And that was his first, after Commonwealth, that was his first uh, international uh, meeting. And there he had these charismatic non-line movement leaders. Everybody supported him. And he said that I need to become a member of the OIC and balance foreign policy. And everyone said that, well, we'll all take you to 1974 Lahore summit. And there, Bangabundu had Pakistan recognize Bangladesh. And then he had Indian troops removed for Bangladesh in the regional uh, uh, politics. If you look at, uh, apart from geopolitics, right at that time, he had uh, you know, um, assigned this 30-year friendship treaty with India and also the 1974 land boundary. He actually set a land boundary with both our, both our neighbors. So with India peacefully and also with Myanmar, if many people don't know, but in 1974, we also signed one with Myanmar. And, um, uh, you know, look at his foreign policy. Uh, from the foreign policy where he receives 116 uh, international organizations recognition and membership within these three years, uh, he had tremendous hunger for bringing Bangladesh to the international uh, you know, uh, arena and to showcase what Bangladesh is made of. I would uh, also like to uh, mention that, you know, uh, reflect a little bit to understand Bangabundu for the new pe uh, young people. What did he say at the United Nations? It's extremely important to reflect on his UN speech. So he was the first Bengali leader or uh, independent Bangladesh's prime minister who goes to the United Nations and he delivers his speech in Bengali. And this speech 
is perhaps Bangladesh's best speech ever. And I do as a documentation, again, I uh, call upon my young friends to actually read the speech. It's available on the net. If you go to the United, just if you Google it, you'll find it, it's available in the United Nations. And in that speech, Bangladesh doesn't speak of Bangladesh. He speaks of global people. He speaks of people who are oppressed, repressed, disenfranchised all over the world. His sympathy is always with the people. And there's a famous quote, it says, it says that the world is divided into two, the oppressed and the oppressor. And I'm always going to stand next to the oppressed. Yes. In the US- Thank you, Thank you honorable uh, high commissioner. Our time is limited. I know, I'm yeah. finished right Thank now. You. So with the quote, I'll finish. So in the UN, and this is a message for today's uh, you know, young people, of course, in his speech, he spoke about the cultural, economic, and social rights, but also against apathy. But he concludes by saying, and I, I quote, um, I would like to conclude by reaffirming my faith in the indomitable spirit of man, in the capacity of the people to achieve the impossible and to overcome insurmountable odds. This is the faith that sustains nations like us that have emerged through struggle and sacrifice. Our nations may suffer, but they can never die. This is what I wanted to mention that, you know, and, and one more sentence he says, in facing the challenge of survival, the resilience and determination of the people is an ultimate strength. So in today's world, in post COVID, where we're all struggling, young people are struggling, and there's so much xenophobia and intolerance, I would urge upon them to take inspiration from this particular, uh, you know, spirit of Bangabundu ideology. <laughs> He believes in the indomitable spirit of mankind and believes that mankind can survive by human strength if they believe in resilience and determination to survive. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency Saida Muna Taslim, the Honorable High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the UK, Ireland and Liberia for your informative and very insightful speech. I think uh, the young, young people of Bangladesh origin will definitely uh, benefit from your very beautiful speech. Now, I'm requesting Barrister Nadia Choudhury, a young leader and law secretary of Forum for Secular Bangladesh and Trial of 1971 War Criminals to talk about how youths are celebrating Mujib year in Bangladesh and abroad. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Mujibu, for that very kind introduction. Um, I would like to first uh, uh, start by uh, really congratulating the British Bangla News and all European Forum for Bangladesh in arranging this uh, uh, event, hopefully, which will be helpful for, for the youth. And even though I've been given the task of um, conveying how the youth uh, are celebrating Bangladesh during Bangabuntu centenary, um, I would like to really start off by talking about my own experience as a member of the young Bengali diaspora in Europe and how I feel like uh, I relate to Bangabuntu. And on, on that note, I would also like to congratulate you on the title of this event, which I think is of particular interest to me. Um, you know, before I came onto this program, I wanted to speak to my dad a little bit uh, to uh, really get an idea of what more I could talk about uh, when it comes to Bongo Bundu. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to really know something different I could talk about him because, you know, when we when we open the news and we, when we hear our parliamentarians uh, speak about Bongo Bundu, we really do hear sort of the same thing over and over again. And I wanted to wanted to hear something a bit different. Um, unfortunately, when I spoke to my dad the, in the first sort of few minutes, um, it was the same old uh, things that, you know, people always say about Bongo Bundu. And it really wasn't interesting for me. And I have to be honest here in how I felt about that conversation with my father initially. Um, as a young member uh, of the Bengali diaspora, having been uh, born and spent a lot of my uh, years in the UK. So um, that's, you know, sort of an indication of the failure, our collective failure in a way uh, that I want to point out as well in being able to pique the interest of uh, the youth in Europe. Now, as someone who was born and raised uh, mostly in, in, in London, you know, I had to face a lot of uh, racism and I felt the sense of marginalization and uh, disenfranchisement and isolation that normally people of a different skin color feel in European countries. And it is 
in a lot of uh, ways, these kind of uh, senses of isolation uh, within these communities that draw these uh, members of these communities to a broader fraternity like the Muslim community uh, that we have in Europe. And, but the problem with that is that, and it's great to be connected to other minority communities, to feel a sense of fraternity where other oppressed communities can come together and feel a sense of fraternity. But the problem is that when we don't have a strong self, uh, sense of our identity, we can often fall prey to extremism, which we know is a problem, um, not only in London, but also in Bangladesh. We see so many hate crimes happening both in London and in Bangladesh and Dhaka. And uh, that is something that we need to be aware of. I don't think it's enough anymore to be talking down to our youth as if we aren't aware. I think it's time that we look at, look at ourselves and realize why we are failing to get the message and, uh, you know, to get the message of Bongo Bontu across to our youth and why we are failing to pique their interest when it comes to Bongo Bontu. Now, Bongo Bontu was a... Um, world leader and that's not celebrated enough we don't see that being celebrated enough he as uh uh your excellency uh, uh monapa said you know she, she quoted him uh many times but i will be adding on to those quotes of you know really secularist identity where bongabundu had said that first he identified as a human being and that is why he was able to relate to the suffering of of human beings worldwide and then secondly, he identified as a uh, Bengali person. And then third, he identified as a Muslim. So the, the identity of, of a Muslim person was not lost upon him, but that is how he identified himself. And as Shaji uh, uh, Joy also today in an event said uh, that secularism is really a strong identity um, of being a Bengali person. Um, because that is, as, sec uh, as uh, Monapa mentioned, that uh, secularism is strongly tied to this identity of being a Bengali person. And it was, in fact, uh, Bongo Bontu who really did coin it as sec coin secularism as um, an ideal which is which shouldn't be separate from uh, religion, uh, but it is a religious pluralism, as Monapa also mentioned. Now. Um, you know, as a young person, I want to know about the ways in which he was actually a rebel leader for the oppressed people. And that shows when he when he passed away, when uh, after he was brutally murdered, uh, we saw these world leaders, these other world leaders come to pay their respects. Uh, and you, you saw people like Yasser Arafat, Tito, Saddam Hussein, uh, Mandela, Castro, Gandhi, all these people paid the respect because he was a world leader who had actually spoken up uh, for the people, for the oppressed people around the world. He spoke up for Vietnamese people. He spoke about Palestinians. Uh, the suffering of the Palestinians. He spoke about uh, South African Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, he spoke about all these uh, people who who were seen as oppressed people around the world, not just for Bangladeshi people. So it's important that we recognize him as a uh, as a world leader and not just um, you know a product of Bangladesh or a leader of, of Bangladesh. And the way our youth can relate to him is not, we don't want to, it's great that he has been recognized as um, the greatest Bengali of all time. Um, it's great that he's led us into independence. All these things are great. It's great that whenever a member of parliament speaks in parliament, they, he pays uh, his respects to uh, all our martyrs and you know they spend minutes and minutes uh, talking about these things. But I wanna hear something new. I wanna hear about why he, has been chosen to, uh, he has been given this title of greatest Bengali of all time. I want to know about the times when he went on hunger strike during our language movement. I want to know about the time when he kept going to jail. He was a rebel leader. He was against, he was anti-establishment. And that's why it really bothers me when um, he has now almost become a brand. You know, when you see the waistcoat, it's become a brand for establishment, which was not really, you know, how he spent his political career. He spent his political career speaking up for the oppressed people, going to jail, standing up against authority. And these are the things that 
I myself and I know my friends uh, can relate to because we, uh, you know, are kind of sick of sick of the establishment and you, our voices, we don't feel like our voices are heard enough through our representatives. And we are spoken down to when we talk about um, our uh, cultural identity, uh, uh, Bongo Bontu, we are spoken down to in a way as if we don't know, but we're, we're living in a global era where we hold a global identity, where the internet is, is now a thing in our, you know, in the palm of our hands, where we can have every information that we want but um you know so we don't uh, in the way that we are spoken down to that sort of makes us disengage when uh bongo bundu's speech or the things that are spoken about over and over again are, are sort of forced down our throats rather than speaking about the things that we could actually relate to as marginalized communities which is also the root of you know where Bang, uh, bongo bundu's um, political career started um, I do feel, you know, when we see um, psycho fanatism in, in our political culture, that doesn't help. That takes away from Bongo Bonto. When you see a member of parliament in parliament spending 10 minutes talking about uh, Bongo Bonto, but saying the same th exact things, and then two days later you hear about him uh, uh, engaging in corruption or doing something that stands completely against Bongo Bondu's ideals. That takes away from Bongo Bondu. That makes us want to not really know about Bongo Bondu because he's, he's a, his identity, his ideals have been hijacked as, uh, uh, as someone who stands for establishment, but which was never the case. As someone who stands for, you know, he's not just an Aum League leader, um, he is a, a world leader. He is a leader of the Bengali people, and he should be a leader or someone we look up to, um, uh, as someone that the young Bengali diaspora in Europe look up to. Because our struggles, uh, in our struggles, we can relate to Bongo Bundu's struggles and how he came into politics. So those are the wa ways in which we can connect. And it's about time that all of us um, look at our failure in the way that we are not being able to uh, get really pique the interest of of these uh, youth who really. Really need to know more about Bongo Bontu. Um, I, I, I will be coming to um, the, the other reasons why I think that uh, you know there isn't enough interest being shown from the youth, uh, which yes, should be. Nadia Choudhury, you have one minute left. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, and then I'll cut it short. Um, uh, and 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 the other thing I would I would like to say is that there isn't enough free space to talk about Bongo Bontu in a critically um, analytical manner. So, you know, my, I have been involved in uh, politics. I have actually moved back permanently uh, to Bangladesh and I have been engaged in politics. And my friends don't really understand how I am involved in politics because they don't see that our ideals actually align with the uh, mainstream politics or the political culture that, that exists in Bangladesh. So, but, uh, you know, my intentions are, and my role model is at Bongo Bontu and I see how, you know, you really have to be involved in politics to be able to change how things are and that's my intention. So that's how I relate to Bongo Bontu and that's my inspiration for coming into uh, uh, politics. Um, and so I do encourage more more free space to talk about Bongo Bontu. Like I want to hear about Bakshal. I know there's so much criticism about Bakshal, but I didn't come to know about Bakshal until a lot later. And I think it was a brilliant piece. It had so many, the five-year plan of where there was population management, there was uh, you know initiatives to empower women, especially those uh, that were impacted by the war. Um, you know, and, and it was a call to unite all of these uh, different political parties and different ideals that would have worked marvelously in my opinion for a war torn country so i want to hear more about these things that we don't hear enough of so that's uh, my my take um a, a, as as a member of the young bengali diaspora uh, who has been raised in uh, europe and to move on to now the initial uh, uh, sort of topic that i was uh, given uh, to talk about uh, you know we are celebrating this year it is not only a celebration that is happening in bangladesh i want uh, this the celebration is happening all over uh, the world there have been announcements um, across the world uh, to try to commemorate bongo bondhu uh, and um, you know we've had the joy bangla youth award that happened today where i quoted uh, uh, joy what he said 
said earlier about secularism, and we have to remember that. Um, and then we had the uh, Young Bangla concert, uh, the movie uh, Doctor's Tale is being shown again, and obviously the International uh, Affairs uh, Subcommittee is actually engaging with um, professors all over the world to try to do more seminars. Although obviously a lot of the events had to be cut down due to COVID-19, uh, you know that the numbers are rising again, so we have to be more careful. And I believe that uh, more and more events will be happening online as opposed to in person. So um, those are my uh, two takes. And um, I, I hope uh, that that was interesting for you to hear. I wanted to give a fresh perspective from a young person's uh, point of view, and I hope that came across. Thank you so much for giving me this time. Yeah, thank you so much, Barista Nadia Chaudhary, for your interesting speech and a marvelous youth perspective on Bangabuntu. Thank you so much. Uh, now I request Julie Begum, Chair of Shadhinata Trust, also a com community volunteer in, uh, in London to give her speech and respond to the High Commissioner and Barrister Nadia Chaudhuri. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to thank ANSA for inviting me on behalf of the All European Neuromo Seminar on uh, Bangladeshi's founder, Sheikh Mujib Rahman, this evening. So thank you for inviting me. And um, to yourself for the opening remarks and i'd like to say thanks to her excellency um the high commissioner saida munna taslim for her um very uh insightful sort of um re uh, background to the founder of the nation and how uh the how relevant he is really to the the lives of the young people in terms of his values and and the way that he he provides an ideal uh, uh, person for us to live up to um, in terms of the the kind of um, uh, uh, the lives of Bengali people here as well as uh, in Bangladesh and also to the barrister Nadia Chaudhry who gave a very passionate sort of um, insight into the way that uh, Bengali identity is still quite um, an emotive issue for a lot of young people and um, looking at ways at how um, we can challenge sort of uh, the ways that the, the father of the nation has been sort of relegated to the sidelines really in terms of the way that he's presented as this um, historical figure but not really people relating to his actions in their daily lives in Bangladesh. So um, what I would like to draw attention to first of all is um, the fact that I am here from uh, the Shadinata Trust and I'd like to give a bit of information about that if that's possible before I respond to um, the uh, uh, the uh, speakers. So the Shadinata Trust is based in Tower Hamlets in, in London and we are here to promote um, uh, uh, Bengali culture, history and heritage to younger people and that is our mission really and we're a secular organisation and we make it our sort of mission to, to engage with young people in in activities, events uh, that um, are relevant and meaningful for young people to get involved with. And I think this is really key when um, we're trying to engage with young people, because it's not just about telling them who we are, it's about also learning from them about who they think they are as Bengali young people, because there isn't one fixed identity of Bengali, identity and we have seen from uh, the diaspora that it isn't just one kind of identity it, people living in bangladesh have lived overseas and have continued to have family and friends in overseas all over the world and there's been a, a very important exchange between bangladesh and uh, the rest of the world which also needs to be um addressed and reflected in our identity so there is not one homogeneous identity and I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from when people are trying to sort of uh, negotiate their um, their identity. Um, Nadia also talked about uh, the kind of issues that people face uh, being a diaspora 
diasporic uh, community overseas. And I think it's really important to raise these issues around racism and how um, Bengali communities have been challenged um, in different places over over the different generations that they've been living overseas in, in different countries. Um, Yes, there are challenges around identity, which sort of impact on people's lives. And it doesn't help when um, Islamophobia makes it very difficult for people to sort of be a, a religious person as well as a Bengali person. And I think there is um, uh, risks of uh, young people falling into radicalization or extremism because the communities, the Bengali communities haven't been able to sustain um, uh, a, a strong cultural identity because there's been so many challenges for, for those diasporic communities uh, in overseas countries that come from racism, but also the, the lack of opportunities for people to be able to um, sustain the kind of cultural identity that people need in order to have a very strong uh, Bengali identity. Before, in the UK, there used to be supplementary schools and classes where Bengali culture and language were a, a very strong part of the community activities. Over the years, these things have been um, cut back and, and not been established in the way that they should be. Other cultural organisations have come and gone. Um, and so it's been a very difficult to keep that kind of sustained cultural and political sort of... Um, presence uh, under really difficult challenges and it's not um, uh, a coincidence that you know Britain has chosen to leave the European community because you know the way that the people here who feel about their relationship to Europe has also had an impact on the way that they feel about their position to the rest of the world so because the fact that immigration and racism has had a really bad, well, a very strong impact on, on the communities that live in the UK, it's made it very difficult for uh, the Bengali community to sort of um, have a, a strong sense of who they are because the, the, there isn't the kind of resources here for people to do that. Also, the kind of um, Islamophobia that's around in the world has has what what's that done is has pushed people into choosing making choices about their identity which have not been very comfortable for the the people living in these countries either and i think that it's not to give excuses but i think when people are being threatened by by um, the state or uh, uh, by um the the main mainstream culture it's very difficult um when people have to choose between is it their language or is it their culture or is it their religion and people end up choosing their religion um because that's the thing that ties them to their family in in this in a very strong sense so i can see that there's been lots of challenges and the fact that you know religion is a very important challenge to the kind of things that we are trying to deal with and even though um, the, uh, the father of the nation was very clear about being a republic and a secular state that has been worn away in Bangladesh itself and there's been huge challenges um, in Bangladesh and these challenges has also been faced in other communities all over the world at the Bengali communities so because people are feeling threatened and have been threatened about different things uh, about their their lives. It's very difficult for people to make choices where they are feeling proud about their Bengali culture and heritage because we ha haven't seen very good examples either in Bangladesh or in the UK sometimes or in other places. Yes, we do have um, representations in parliament and local government but even so, um, it's not enough, really, when we see uh, the Bengali identity or culture being sort of challenged in on a daily basis. And the foundations of Bangladesh have not been realised um, in the current politics of the country that, that's already there. So in all in all, I think there is a lot of challenge 
um, for young people when they have to make choices about their, their identity. And I think it's important to understand that it's not going to be a simple matter of just saying I'm a Bengali. I think it's really important to actually, dis, you know, create um, uh, opportunities for people to discuss their identity in a way that's going to be a meaningful and relevant um, experience, and for people to be able to say, you know, that what they are without having been told or being uh, forced to be something that they're not. So um, I'd like to, uh, you know, as, as from the point of view of the Shadinata Trust, we are engaged in projects which engage young people uh, about their experiences in the UK, um, their experiences um, uh, as uh, young people, but also as members of their community, uh, getting them to connect with the history and culture of uh, Bengalis in, in Britain, but also celebrating their cultural heritage by um, uh, uh, taking part in festivals and events like the Boy Shaggy Mela. We also are um, supporting uh, with uh, projects around music and musicians of Bengali origin. We work with um, documenting um, sort of our um, anti-racist history in the UK. Um, we work currently with organisations that are looking at how Bengal Bangladeshis have been challenged by the coronavirus pandemic. So what we are trying to do is to make sure that we stay relevant in the lives of the people that we are working with in our communities. And I think that's that's the one way that we can really make sure that we engage uh, young people really in the life of um, uh, of, of, of their communities, but also to uh, help them connect with uh, the, their origins and their Bengali culture. And the, the one of the ways that we could do that is to have these conversations uh, between people, um, their, their, their own families. So a lot of young people haven't had a conversation about their cultural heritage with their families it doesn't really take place. And I think we need to create resources like the Shadinata Trust or uh, in uh, mainstream education where there is a place for young people to find out about uh, their Bengali culture, heritage and history. And I think there is a lot of um, a space and scope to, for uh, uh, black and minority ethnic people to make sure that their history is being included as a part of the British history and curriculum. In, yeah, in Judy Begum, I want to interrupt you. Sorry, uh, you have one yeah. minute left, please. Okay, so I'll round up by saying thank you to uh, all the panel uh, members who've been speaking today and the invitation to come and uh, add my response to the speakers of the, from the High Commission and Nadia Chowdhury, Barrister. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie Begum, for your valuable speech. I appreciate that very much. Now it's time for a Q&A session. Uh, so if any of our viewers have any question, please feel free to question here uh, in the comments section of our program or, or through our vid video link. So do we have any question? Uh, answer by. I don't see any question. In that case, probably I should. Uh, OK. Uh, Farin Daula, inspiring words of Bangabandhu, the father of our nation by our honorable high commissioner. As a nation, we must carve out religious fundamentalism and promote peace and tolerance. Just how Bangabandhu envisioned the secular nation. Thank you so much, Farin Daula, for your comments. Uh, Prashanto Purokayasto, written, thanks for delivering such an authentic and crystal clear explanation. Honorable High Commissioner Saida Muna Taslim, much appreciated. Thank you, Prashanto Purokayasto. Imran Ahmed Choudhury has written, excellent presentation. Thank you, Mr. Imran Ahmed Choudhury. Uh, and Bikash Choudhury Bulwa from uh, uh, Netherlands has written, enjoying, enjoying. Thank you. Uh, Shahid Rahman has written important issues are being discussed about Bangabandhu. Greetings to all the guests. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Shahid Rahman. 
Uh, Nuruzzaman Disio has written excellent program. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nuruzzaman Disio. Uh, he's from Bangladesh. Roshanto Purokashto, this presentation should be shared widely in Bangladesh. I wonder about the number of citizens in Bangladesh born after liberation are aware of these true facts. Thank you so much, Mr. Purokashto. Wonderful presentation you have written again. Thank you so much for your feedback. Chris Blackburn has written excellent speech from her Excellency Saida Munatasim, very informative about Bangabandhu's ideals and work. Thank you so much, Mr. Chris. Chris. Uh, Prashanta Purokasto written very well said. Thank you, Mr. Purokasto. Uh, Farin Dola has written very well said, Nadia Chodhuri. We need to focus on Bangabandhu's ideals that young people can relate to. Thank you so much. Uh, Jayanto Purokasto has written, I'm proud of you as a Bangladeshi Canadian because excellent speech. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Purokaisto. Please, Black Blackburn has written, is there a European Civic Award, much like Joy Bangla Youth Award, that recognizes the work of young organizations and individuals who follow and lead the ideals and values of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman? Uh, that is, OK. Uh, Nadia Chaudhary has written, Farin Dula, thank you so much for uh, Farin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so these are the comments so far we have got from feedback we got from our uh, our audience. Uh, so if we don't get any, uh, okay, Salim Samad has written, Doftari Bhai and Asarullah Bhai, Bengali is Bengali, not Bengali. The speakers are making wrong connotation, which is in contradiction to Bangladesh constitution. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. <laughs> Salim Samad. Yeah. Mujib Bhai, uh, can I interrupt? I'd like yes, to respond yes. to some of the um, recommendations that have been, or some of the you know, um, aspirations that Nadia has put forward, as well as Ms. Julie Begum. Could I respond to that? I mean, yes, one or two. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think and there, there are a number of issues that are brought up, and particularly all the people that have written. Yes, I had mentioned uh, sort of in a limited time what the international community thought about Bongo Bontu. I try to give this message that every Bengali should be of Bangladeshi or overseas Bengalis in UK and Europe should be proud. Every young person should be proud if they have any linkage to Bangladesh, because without Bangabundu, there would be no Bangladesh. So I wanted them to feel proud about this great world leader that we had had the opportunity uh, to um, have been led by. And today we have a country, uh, they mentioned, you know, Miss Julie Wigan mentioned that, you know, the, the secular, uh, state policy are wearing away. Actually, the state it is just the opposite. You see, uh, right now we have Bongo Bundu's daughter, Prime Minister Shikasina, who's uh, uh, who's been you know uh, uh, the prime minister for the last ten years. And in ten years, she's achieved. She's consistently, systematically tried to bring back what was taken away in 1975. Now, this is true that the ideology of a Bengali nationalism-based secular state was Bongo Bundu's. Uh, greatest gift to Bangladesh. However, there are people who oppose it, and there are people in Bangladesh who still oppose it. So we need to understand that in our statehood, this is you know this people who are conflicting, who are actually against this Bengali nationalism, secularism. How far they would benefit by that? Now look at today's Bangladesh. So in 1972, the constitution that I spoke about, it was actually tainted. It was uh, destroyed in 1975. And following uh, successive, you know, um, the secular nature was taken away, religious freedom clause was taken away. But in 2011, Prime Minister Shikusina, again, Bongo Bundu's visionary daughter, rather missionary daughter, she's brought back by 15th Amendment of the Constitution, reinstated the secularism by removing the absolute trust and faith in the Almighty Allah from our Constitution, and also reinstating Bengali nationalism as the religious freedom clause in the Constitution, whereby it ensures that along with Islam, equal status and equal right in the practice of the Hindu, Buddhist, Christian and other religions in Bangladesh. She's also included transgender. So in our passport form, where there are, you know, you have three genders, you are either male, female, or you can be other. So transgenders have been given a strong recognition. This is the inclusive secular policy, you know, that uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is, has, you know, it's like the uh, the legacy of Bongo Bundu that she's carrying forward. Now, if we were not the secular state, what we would have been is an Islamic Republic. And if you see, if you listen to even Prime Minister Imran Khan's speech in many civil society, many, many civil society people, many journalists who are pointing out today that had we had Bangladesh, you know, this Bangladesh, which was created in 1971 as a poor country, you know, 
uh, there was clear racial discrimination against the Bengali nation uh, and the Bengali people. Sorry, I, I must say Bengali people. And, uh, you know, there was clear discrimination, racial discrimination, xenophobia towards us. And, you know, it's just, uh, you know, undermining uh, our, our identity. So from that perspective, had we not become, if today if it was not being nurtured by the state, who else will nurture it? So the state is consistently nurturing it because of these inclusive values. Our per capita income has gone up. Bangladesh is still, in terms of human development index, the number one country in South Asia. So right now, our human HDI index are only competing with Sri Lanka's. But you know, uh, look at our population, and in terms of uh, you know people's life expectancy, in terms of growth, uh, World Economic Forum, in terms of gender, uh, you know, a gender parity uh, in South Asia. Uh, World Economic Forum numbers say that we are the top country in the world where there is least gender uh, disparity. So from many perspectives, the fact that we are inclusive, uh, we, we are hanging on to our Bengali nationalism, there's great hope for young people in Bangladesh like Nadia. I think that there's a revival of Bengali nationalism because of 10 years of consistent uh, you know, uh, uh, assertion of this Bengali cultural identity. So for young people, I would like to say for Julie Begum that you know, in, in the United Kingdom, you're absolutely right. We need to have a Bangladesh cultural center. The Bali community can actually take pride in their, um, uh, you talked about resources, but you know, right now we don't have one, but I would encourage everyone to stay connected to the High Commission and any cultural identity program that we want to assert are, you know, the, the fundamentals of young people, how they can take inspiration from our Bengali, Bangladeshi, Bangla cultural uh, identity and Bongo Bundu's ideologies, I think we need to work more. And somebody yes, suggested. Honor, Honorable uh, High Commissioner, there is the one question to you uh, yes. by uh, Prashanto Purokayasto. Question is What is the master plan for the government to establish Bongo Bundu's Bangladesh? Would you please answer that? I think the master plan is already been laid out by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in her Vision 2021 and Vision 2041. Uh, it, in that particular vision, there is no discrimination. Uh, even yesterday, our Honorable Foreign Minister of Bangladesh gave a speech, and this was a, the, uh, uh, an international conference that uh, Poland has organized following the recent, you know, racial uh, sort of xenophobia and violence uh, and terrorism in, in, in France. So in that particular, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, meeting just yesterday, our, our Foreign Minister has unequivocally uh, reaffirmed that, you know, the, uh, I would just quote on a quote from his speech, and he says that Bangladesh has steadfastly, steadfastly maintained a peaceful coexistence of different groups and ensured the safety and security of all citizens, irrespective of their religion or background. And religion pluralism is a cornerstone of the secular identity of Bangladesh. And this emanates from the fundamental principle laid down for the state by our father of the nation. Now, uh, responding to his question, that is that not the master plan? But of course, there are more uh, uh, action-oriented, uh, you know, um, projects that the government has undertaken, uh, in, including, you know, uh, we have brought in the Komi Madrasa education into the mainstream. This is a humongous, Herculean task. But, you know, our prime minister has achieved that. Today, you know, uh, what we want to see is everybody getting a science education and English education, mathematics. That's exactly what's happening. So, you know, de-radicalization, de-radicalizing people or young people who might be victim to a wrong interpretation of the religion or trying to, uh, you know, sort of draw them into uh, religion-based politics of fundamentalism. What is the government doing against it? There are quite a number of projects in that area. So we are also in the global uh, combating, you know, extreme violence. We are a executive board member of that organization in Geneva. In counterterrorism, our, you know, uh, global counterterrorism index, uh, our state's uh, index in fighting counterterrorism and combating extremism, we are actually top in South Asia because our record is impeccable. And uh, from that perspective, I think uh, if you look at our neighboring region, our neighboring country, India and other countries, our relationship, uh, one of the uh, fundamentals that we are praised for is our zero tolerance towards uh, against terrorism and, uh, and extremism. These are the values and actions that the government, you know, one can uh, consider to be a master plan as to how we sustain our secular and inclusive identity uh, for the next generation. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Honorable uh, High Commissioner. There is another question from Chris Blackburn. Question is, is there a European Civic Award such much like Joy Bangla Youth Award that recognizes the work of young organizations and no, individuals to follow the live, uh, live the ideals and values of Sheikh Mojibur Rahman? Uh, that is humanism, social justice, multiculturalism, religious pluralism, 
Human and Civil Rights and Development Work. A question by Chris Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Blackburn. Um, I think that um, right now there isn't an award. Uh, however, Bangladesh High Commission plans to uh, declare such an award specifically for young people. And it could be the Mujib Borshu uh, Youth Leadership Award, but actually, you know, it should be linked to Bengali cultural identity and being all those values. So currently there isn't, but there has to be. So we plan from the High Commission to declare one uh, this year. And we want young people from UK, and that's my jurisdiction, you know, UK and Ireland, people who've already, you know, uh, have, a, have demonstrated a proven a sense of leadership and an inclusive leadership in you know religious pluralism they work as you know like I, we just met some young people like nadia and others but there are many others who have actually they're leaders in their own community and they're actually contributing to an inclusive society like bangladesh values they're actually promoting it and they are bengali so definitely you know we plan to have an award like that and thanks for your idea but we are already considering that but currently i don't think there is an award Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Saida Muna Tasneem, Honorable High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the UK for answering all the questions. Uh, now I request uh, Torun Kanti Chaudhuri, President of All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh from Sweden, to summarize today's speeches and to conclude the seminar session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mujib Dr. First, I would like to pay homage to homage and tribute to our Bangladesh Sheikh Muti Muraman in his centenary birthday. Uh, we, and, we, and I would like to thank you, Her Excellency, High Commissioner of Bangladesh in London for the great speech. You have covered all his, from his childhood to this education and uh, his political work, especially on his vision and his what he has given to the Bangladesh, which is, not, is a unique one, 1972 constitution, which is totally secular and unique. And it is based upon the Ford Foundation. I'm not going to explain it. You can find it in the, if you Google it, you will find it all. And another point we have to mention that he is the only leader in Bangladesh who made the people united together after 7th March 1971. One country, one leader like that. Before that, there were many political parties, different races, different ide ideologies. When Bangabandhu spoke about that, self-sufficiency of Bangladesh at that time it was East Pakistan to for autonomy and everything then all the works of people united together irrespective of race political party and everything and he is the one who showed them another example of non-violence when he said everything should be closed, everything should be paralyzed, everyone listened to him. He was the only one leader in the Bangladesh at that time. Then you, then he have given that that seventh March speech became history and it is recognized by the UNESCO as well. And he was the another Bengali person who gave the speech in United Nations in Bengali as well. When you go, go through his life history and everything you will find, first, he was attached with the Muslim League, then became Muslim Army League, then became our League. He is the another example, He, what he feel, what he felt, he did it. His words and works get hand by hand. That's why everyone respected him and loved him. And we, if we go through his life history, we will find how he made his changes. He is the change, like Gandhi said, you, have be, you must be the change if you want to see the change. So he priority. He pushed up the humanity above all. 
humanity came first, then came nationalism, then religion came at last because it's a personal matter. So this was is about the life history and we must follow his ideology. We must know his goal, what he wanted to make Bangladesh to become a golden Bangladesh. And our Barrister Nadia Chogri had said something about corruption against racism and how they feel from the second generation of diaspora. Thank you for that. And Julie Begum talked about Bengali identity, the role of the trust engagement of the diaspora to maintain culture, tradition, heritage and history. And we have some questions and answer and everything and our Her Excellency explained it very well. So it was all thing about Pangabodhu Sheikh Mujibur Ramana, which we appreciate him as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Torun Kanti Chaudhuri, President of All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh for your valuable remarks and concluding remarks. So I take this opportunity to thank our distinguished guests for uh, taking their time to participate in today's seminar on Bangladesh Bangabandhu's Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and his values and ideals. I thank Her Excellency Saida Munatasnim, Honorable Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, Ireland and Liberia. Uh, I thank you so much for uh, giving your time here, Your Excellency. Thank you. I really enjoyed uh, it. Yeah, I thank Barrister Nadia Chaudhuri, Law Secretary, Forum for Secular Bangladesh and Trial of 1971 War Criminals. Thank you for coming, giving your time, though it's very midnight in Bangladesh. Thank you for st staying with us. And Julie Begum, Chair, Shadhinata Trust uh, from London. Thank you so much for coming. And Torun Kanti Chaudhuri, President, All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh from Sweden. And Ansar Ahmedullah, Secretary General, All, All European Forum for Secular Bangladesh from London, United Kingdom. Uh, I thank British Bangla News TV for broadcasting this seminar. Uh, I thank the viewers of British Bangla News for uh, staying tuned with us to listen to us from our valuable guests.